tonight as Yellowknife residents prepare for what could be a difficult journey home. Wildfire smoke blankets Alberta again. Once we get up to this level, we can start seeing issues with eyes tearing, uh, the nose burning. Why the dangerous air quality could last for days. A deepening crisis for Ontario's government over the Green Belt scandal with the resignation of its housing minister. Where does it end? Because it all smells pretty bad to Ontarians. And seniors thriving in a young person's world. I don't want to look 25. Where's the bacon? We break down why grandfluencers are having a moment. We don't have to buy into this, oh, when you reach a certain age, life's over. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thanks for joining us. Right now, essential workers are resuscitating a city, returning to Yellowknife and preparing it for residents as the evacuation order gradually lifts. Yellowknife was left nearly empty in suspended animation for weeks as fire crews fought to keep wildfires at bay. The rest of the city's 20,000 residents will be allowed back Wednesday, some making a long trek from evacuation centers in Calgary, north on the only open highway from Alberta into the Northwest Territories. If it stays open, that route and much of the region is still menaced by dozens of active fires. Canada's summer of ash and flame is far from over. And Terry Reith shows us that is a reality nearly impossible to escape in Alberta in particular, a province blanketed in thick, hazardous smoke. Alberta spent its Labor Day shrouded in smoke, just being outside a potential health risk. Oh yeah, it's my birthday today and I thought we were going to celebrate, but instead we're just going to hang out inside and not do anything really that uh, affects me because I got asthma, so it's really tough to hang out here. Both Calgary and Edmonton have set new annual records for the most number of days with smoky conditions. And there is little relief in the forecast. With more than 1,000 fires burning in Canada, especially in the West, smoke will continue to cover much of the nation. In Calgary, the Canadian Football League's annual Labor Day Classic went ahead, despite air quality peaking out at a 9 out of 10 in the hours leading up to kickoff. Uh, it's not ideal, but uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss it. I always uh, do this. Doctors worry the smoke is pushing into the danger zone. So once we get up to this level, we can start seeing issues with um, kind of eyes tearing, uh, the nose burning. You can feel the sensation of having to cough or a sore throat. Uh, you can also have difficulty breathing even if you don't have any underlying medical conditions. But this weekend has allowed firefighters to get an upper hand on some of the more dangerous fires. Those threatening homes in Kelowna and the Shushwaps. And some evacuees have been able to go home. Yellowknife is now allowing essential workers back. More residents can begin returning home on charter flights Wednesday. But it will take time to get services and schools up and running. You are coming back to Yellowknife and it's going to be basic services. So limited health care, the grocery stores aren't fully back and operational. It'll have limited staff, uh, banks, you know, take a bit of time to get up, pharmacy. So Terry, Calgary went ahead with the Labor Day Classic. Uh, Yellowknife is returning, but it's really hard to call any of this a return to normal. Yeah, well, you can see the haze in the air, Adrian. I can smell it. It's still a lot of smoke in the area. And with more hot, dry weather forecast for the month of September, things are not going to get much better. And some of these fires are so deep, so entrenched, that they could be smoldering till the spring. Incredible. All right, Terry Reith in Edmonton, thank you. This wildfire season isn't just a possible symptom of climate change. It could also contribute to it. At the bottom of the clock on the breakdown, Susan Orison explores the consequence of so much blackened forest and the explosion of carbon released into the air. Ontario's housing minister has resigned after weeks of revelations that developers influenced his office to remove environmental protections and clear the way for them to build and make billions. And as Travis Danraj shows us, despite the resignation for critics, the controversy is far from over. The writing had been on the wall for weeks. That Steve Clark's days as Ontario's housing minister were numbered. Still, he and the premier had dug in. 
Why don't you resign today, Minister? I, I, I'm here to accept responsibility. I have confidence in Minister Clark. He has a big file. Monday, that all changed. I feel that it is my responsibility to adhere to principles of ministerial accountability, Clark said. As such, please accept my resignation. In August, Ontario's Auditor General identified major issues with the removal of nearly 3,000 hectares of once protected land around Toronto known as the Green Belt. The report detailed how well-connected developers stood to gain billions. We saw what we think is preferential treatment. Then, an Integrity Commissioner report just last week delivered another series of blows, in part shedding light on a figure known as Mr. X, described as an unregistered lobbyist who would bank over a million dollars if protections were stripped from a plot of land just outside Toronto. Sources identified him to CBC News as former Clarington Mayor John Mutton. Mutton denies the allegations but is seen in multiple pictures with ministers and the Premier. Where does it end? Do we have to look now at every other policy and deal that this government is making and who's benefiting? Because, you know, it all smells pretty bad to Ontarians. The Premier needs to open the books and waive cabinet privilege. That's why we need an independent public inquiry. While Ontario's opposition parties push for land to be returned to the Green Belt, Ford is pushing forward with his plan and a new minister to deal with the fallout and the housing crisis. And Travis, we're hearing that the now former Ontario Housing Minister already has a replacement. Yeah, that's right, Adrian. A very busy holiday Monday here at Queen's Park. Paul Calandra takes over the role from Steve Clark. He is the former Minister of Long-Term Care and the House Leader. He is going to have a very busy fall, of course, with the PC government as they deal with the fallout of both of these reports. All right, thank you. Travis Damrej in Toronto. Multiple U.S. media sources are reporting that North Korea's leader Kim Jong-un plans to visit Russian President Vladimir Putin sometime this month. So the two have met before and are reportedly developing a close relationship looking to boost military cooperation. For its part, Russia wants North Korean weapons for its war in Ukraine, while the North is looking for advanced technology for satellites and nuclear-powered submarines. Today, Putin met with another leader. Turkey's president was trying to convince him to rejoin a deal to ship Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea. It is seen as crucial for the global food supply. But as Briar Stewart shows us, the deal is still off. The meeting was weeks in the making. But even though Turkey's president made the trip to Sochi, it wasn't enough to revive the grain deal. So Turkey is now appealing for compromise. Ukraine needs to soften its approach, said Recep Tayyip Erdogan, referring to the UN-backed deal which broke down this summer when Russia pulled out. Vladimir Putin accuses Western countries of blocking Russian food and fertilizer from world markets, and he says he would agree to the grain deal if some of the restrictions around international banking and insurance were lifted. Under the deal last year, more than 30 million tons of grain, corn and sunflower products were shipped out of Ukraine, exports which the UN said helped to lower surging food prices. But since July, only three ships have crossed Istanbul's Bosphorus Strait. Ukraine is trying to increase grain exports through its ports along the Danube River, which borders Romania. But that too can be dangerous. Ukraine's ports have repeatedly come under attack, including last night. Ukrainian officials said some of the Russian drones used in this attack fell on Romanian territory. But Romania, a NATO member, denies that. Still, experts say without a deal, there's always that risk. We don't think that this is the, the, the ideal uh, way to move forward. This former Turkish diplomat used to be stationed in Moscow. She says despite Turkey's success in helping to negotiate the grain deal, it has little sway now. But what Russia wants, what Putin wants, is to see uh, concessions coming from the West. Turkey says it's making a series of recommendations to help restart the grain deal, which follows proposals made by the UN last month. But Russia says it will only agree to the deal if its demands are met. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. The Prime Minister has begun a whirlwind international tour. So here's Justin Trudeau and his son Xavier leaving for Jakarta 
where Trudeau will attend the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Summit. Later in the week, he'll head to Singapore for trade talks. Then he's off to New Delhi for the G20 summit. Tens of thousands of people streamed out of the Burning Man Festival in Nevada today after a soggy, cold and very muddy weekend. As Sarah Levitt shows us, it was a relief for many who until this point couldn't leave even if they wanted to. They call the end of Burning Man the exodus and this one lived up to the name. The roads are still pretty muddy and there's still standing water and so there, there's new roads that are forming around. Long lines of cars snaked through the drenched desert. I made it. <laughs> Anastasia Kartomesheva says getting out wasn't easy. When you see that uh, so many cars are already stuck, even the big SUVs, I actually I lost my hope. And then the survival mode, the adrenaline came again. Before today, festival goers were told not to leave. The gates were closed because of treacherous road conditions. Torrential rains turned the dry, dusty desert bed into a muddy mess. In 24 hours, they got two to three months worth of rain. We are accustomed to extreme weather here. It was 107 degrees here last year um, for several days. And it's, it's kind of part of the challenge and the ritual uh, to actually, you know, be in the middle of extreme weather and uh, work our way out of it gracefully gracefully and with patience, as tens of thousands of people make their way out. As much as I'm lucky, I am grateful. Some, though, are staying behind. They say the true meaning of the festival is community, and the rain made everybody come together. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Washington. The former lead singer of the rock band Smash Mouth has died. Steve Harwell was known for hit singles like I'm a Believer and All Stars. Well, the years start coming and they don't stop coming. Fed to the rules and I hit the ground running. Didn't make According to a statement from Harwell's manager, the singer died at his home in Idaho, surrounded by family and friends. The band's manager says Harwell's cause of death was acute liver failure. He was 56. Tonight, as millions of Canadian kids get ready to head back to school, many classrooms are short on one crucial supply, teachers. As Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us, some boards are using unqualified people to fill in the gaps. As a professor of education who is also a math and science teacher, Tasha Osman thinks a lot about what teacher shortages mean for her profession. Though her Gatineau school is well staffed, some in Quebec have had to resort to taking on members of the public to watch over classes. If we bring people into the education system that aren't qualified in the professional standards, in the pedagogical techniques that are, are needed for, for teaching, we're devaluing that profession. Teacher shortage goes well beyond Quebec. We're feeling a pinch. In Nunavut, they have about 10% vacancy rate. When we have vacancies, that means, you know, you have teachers that are losing prep time, they're doing double duty. In BC, finding qualified teachers is especially hard for rural and remote areas like Prince George and Chilliwack. We're now at kind of a crisis point, I would say, where we have a lot of um, uncertified individuals being hired to teach. Um, we have frequent inability to fill jobs. He says teacher shortages predate the pandemic, but it's made the problem worse as additional stresses and fears of COVID infection have made many retire early or leave the profession. There are different proposed solutions. In some parts of the country, local universities have shortened teachers college so that newly minted teachers can join the ranks earlier. In places like Ontario, teacher unions are asking for higher pay to keep up with a rising cost of living. If you take a look at that map. One thing many agree on, the work has to be made less stressful so that those who are in it don't leave. I feel that people don't realize the amount of violence that teachers face on a, on a daily basis. Problems that need to be solved to attract more young people to a profession that despite it all, Tasha Osman says she loves more than anything in the world. My students are happy people, they're curious, they're interesting, uh, they're funny, and we do great work. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. We have some developing news out of Calgary. An E. coli outbreak has sent up to 50 children to the ER this long weekend. Alberta Health Services says it believes it originated in a kitchen shared by a daycare operator called Fueling Brains. It has multiple locations across the city.
The company says it will provide more information tomorrow. Rising interest rates and the rising cost of living are on the minds of many tonight, and they were front and center at Labor Day parades and rallies across Canada today. This summer has seen a cross-section of workers walking off the job. And as Thomas Daigle tells us, another major industry might be next. Pay your workers while we work! For many Canadians, Labor Day means a little more this year. After the so-called summer of strikes, Parades across the country had workers marching with added resolve. Uh, the cost of everything has gone up uh, and workers are left behind. From BC port workers to Manitoba Liquor Mart staff, the summer saw union members at multiple workplaces walk off the job, then reach new deals. I think the message is that if governments and employers want labor stability, they need to make sure that they give workers what they deserve. Now, Ontario auto workers are among those who've approved new strike mandates, raising the prospect of heated talks through the fall. And I think people are going to strengthen because they're going to see the corporate elite eroding away what we have. With inflation pushing up the cost of living and wages often not keeping pace, experts wonder whether a drive to unionize is coming to more unlikely places. Consider Toronto area Metro grocery stores. Set to reopen Tuesday after a month long closure, workers claimed a rare win for private sector lower wage earners when their strike drove the company to offer better pay. Can that translate into a wave of say union organizing that's successful? It's possible periods of high inflation bring about more labor unrest. It doesn't always go smoothly. Unionized commercial actors have been effectively locked out for a year and a half, while after months of failed bargaining, workers at Ontario Public Broadcaster TVO have walked off the job too. They're members of the Canadian Media Guild, which also represents some CBC staff. Where strikes are concerned, you can never uh, think that the solution is going to know when the solution is going to arrive. For some, the gamble paid off emboldening unions to consider more action and push for greater demands. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. James Smith Cree Nation is marking the anniversary of one of Canada's worst mass murders. How do we heal from We don't know. The grief still gripping a community and why some are hopeful for the future. The threat from wildfires long after they're out. Will this forest now keep emitting this carbon for years? Yes, exactly. Susan Ormiston takes us into the once flourishing Quebec wilderness. But first, a parliamentary visit like never before. The immersive experience that's captivating audiences. It grabbed you emotionally, which I didn't expect. We're back in two. This is Montreal, where six people were injured at a park when a man drove his car into them last night. Police say it happened during a fight between the 22-year-old driver and several others. Some people were seriously hurt, but no one has life-threatening injuries. The driver was arrested at the scene. Police say the investigation is ongoing. It's been one year since Canada's deadliest mass stabbing, and for people living in James Smith Cree Nation, it's been a year of grief, fear, and just trying to cope with immense trauma. Sam Sampson spoke with those who lost family in the attacks about the search for answers and how they're trying to rebuild their lives. This is what Daryl Burns loves, a chariot race, family, temporary solace. When I'm doing this, it takes my mind off of all the turmoil. What would you tell your sister? I tell her we're, try we're, we're trying to move on. How big of a hole she left in her lives. Daryl's sister Gloria was among 11 killed last year. On September 4th, 2022, 32-year-old Miles Sanderson went from house to house in James Smith Cree Nation, stabbing his own community members. He fled, killed another man in the nearby village of Weldon, then vanished. RCMP arrested him almost four days later, but they say he went into medical distress and died, leaving the community with no answers about what triggered the attacks. 11 people killed, 17 others hurt. This is complex trauma at its finest. Glenda Watson is one of eight therapists working with families who lost loved ones. They're so hypervigilant, they're stuck in this state. How can I assist you to get out of the state for a moment so you can feel a sense of calm, 
connectedness, groundedness, because that's literally all they were trying to do was, I need to learn to function again. Fear of violence pervades this community. A security team patrols James Smith 24-7. Many believe mental health issues, trauma, and addictions led to the attacks. Local health officials say they're using federal money to create new programming and plan a new wellness center. Brian Burns, known as Buggy, finds safety in ceremonies like horse dances. As soon as I get out, I feel refreshed, uh, like a brand new me again. Buggy lost his oldest son, Gregory, and his wife, Bonnie. Another son survived his stab wounds. Buggy combines tradition with counseling and sobriety. I didn't want to lose my boys, uh, leave my boys. We already lost so much. Yeah, that's good enough for her. She's not As an addictions counselor, Daryl Burns helps others untangle the darkest parts of their lives. The attacks, he says, compounded that already complicated work. We've never had uh, someone stab 11 members of their own, basically their own family. So how do we heal from it? We don't know. Everyone's different, so we need to, we need to try and do as many different things as we can. We've had hundreds and hundreds of years of oppression. If we can start making our children proud of themselves, that's going to be huge for our future. So we have to keep going, no matter how hopeless it seems, we have to keep going. In this moment, at least, Yay! everything is okay. Sam Sampson, CBC News, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. Renovations on Parliament Hill are still far from complete, but there's a new way to take in the sights. The reactions have been really, really positive and exciting for people when they walk in. The exhibit that's once again opening the doors to Centre Block. Plus, the continued impact of Canada's historic wildfire season. It's not a new normal, it's a, a continuously worsening situation that we currently face. The potential consequences of failing to act. And the trend that helped coin a new term. Being 80 years old, I never planned on being an influencer. Introducing you to Grandfluencers. The National breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. The trial of two key organizers of the convoy protest begins tomorrow in Ottawa. Tamara Leach and Chris Barber will face charges of mischief, obstructing police, counseling others to commit mischief and intimidation. The demonstrations brought downtown Ottawa to a standstill for weeks. The trial is expected to last at least 16 days. The rebuild of Parliament's center block is expected to take years, but while that work grinds along, there's a new way to experience the history inside. Catherine Cullen walks us through it. Tourists still flock to this symbol of Parliament, but center block will be under renovation for another seven or eight years. So now, there's a new way to see it. At times, the multimedia show can feel just like standing in center block, but with added flash. So far, the reactions have been really, really positive and exciting for people when they walk in, like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that. The goal, to help Canadians understand the importance of Parliament. It's an opportunity for Canadians to connect with Parliament, parliamentarians, why it's important in our lives, and to understand that there are things that happen in those buildings that affect us on a day-to-day -day basis that we may not even be mindful about. It's certainly a unique way to look at the epicentre of Canadian politics. I want to take a look at the House of Commons here. Oh, sure. I love this. It is so cool because I remember sitting right up there. That's where the oh, press gallery wow. used to be. The show also looks at other spaces currently closed to the public, like Parliament's ornate library and the Memorial Chamber, which honours Canada's war dead. It also features Centre Block's political history, from wartime debates to the Chinese head tax to the apology for residential schools. It's important that we continue to discuss those things and bring them to the forefront to allow us to, to continue to, to speak about them uh, and ensure that our history is, is represented in the way that it, it, it occurred over the years. The current home of the House of Commons can't accommodate as many tours, meaning this is the way many visitors will now experience Parliament. Many tours are already fully booked. I thought it was amazing. What was uh, your favorite part? 
It was so immersive, it was so captivating, it grabbed you emotionally, which I didn't expect. I like that it was really interactive um, and kind of artistic. It cost $2.8 million to create and build the components of the experience. Visitors see it for free. Shows are expected to continue for years to come. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. So every night at this time, The National will take you inside the stories, dominating conversations in this country, and then we'll figure out what's next. So we begin tonight with the lasting damage of the wildfires for Canada and the world. This is The Breakdown. A summer of fire, the worst ever. All this will sabotage Canada's climate goals long after the flames are out. It's a, a continuously worsening situation. The unprecedented inferno released way more carbon than all human activity. So who is responsible for all that? Our international climate correspondent Susan Ormiston goes deep into the charred remains of a boreal forest in Quebec to break down the impact of Canada's summer of fire. Show me, Fabio, the soil. So the top soil layer uh, completely burn, and uh, we know that uh, in uh, the boreal forest, normally uh, the uh, around the uh, fifty percent of the carbon is stored into the soil. So we lost a lot of carbon here. Uh, Where did it go? It goes in the atmosphere. It's being emitted into the yeah, atmosphere? Yeah, it's going directly emitting into the atmosphere. The hidden costs of a blazing summer. Burned forests piling on to our climate crisis. So uh, this was part of the huge fire that we had this, uh, this spring in Quebec. Our guide is Fabio Generati, a forest science professor in Quebec. And how severe was the fire here? As you can see here, all the trees were killed by, by, by the fire. So it was a crown fire, meaning that uh, the fire burned the branches, the upper branches of the, of the trees. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, was extremely high severe. Remember June? The wildfires that raged through the boreal forest here sent that choking smoke to the city south, turning them red and hazy. It was like a hundred years of firefighting all at once. An early sign of an unprecedented summer as massive fires threatened Canadian communities. But inside the forests, climate perils, huge ones. The fire uh, burned for about, about uh, 20 days. 20 days? Yeah. Across the region, flames for 60 days, leaving graveyards of jack pine and spruce only now with hints of green poking through. Normally in a forest, the growing trees take in carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis, store the carbon for years, a huge hedge against rising greenhouse gas emissions. But this summer, the inferno released that carbon, making Canada the world leader in fire emissions. Europe's Copernicus program measures wildfires using satellite imagery. Here's the trend. The black line is the yearly average of carbon emissions from Canadian wildfires over 20 years. The red line is this year's, more than double. I think the fact Dr. Mark Parrington is a senior uh, scientist. Three and a half months of non-stop fire emissions from Canada is quite stark that it's we're not seeing such a big signal from, from anywhere else around the, the Northern Hemisphere. In British Columbia, Werner Kurtz, a senior research scientist at Natural Resources Canada, has been warning for decades about the rising intensity of wildfires. It is a unprecedented, record-breaking fire season in Canada, across the country, almost twice the previous record. Over 15 million hectares burned, releasing vast amounts of carbon. We are now facing emissions in the order of 1.7 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. That's over two and a half times the emissions of all other sectors in the Canadian economy combined. 
That means this year's fires gave off more CO2 equivalent emissions than all the cars fleeing them. In fact, more than all the annual emissions from cars, trucks and industry in Canada combined. As uh, climate change continues to impact the length of the fire season, the drought conditions, fires will continue to increase. So it's not a new normal, it's a, a continuously worsening situation that we currently face. The camera's rolling. We put that to Environment and Climate Change Minister Stephen Gilbeau. This year is by far the worst year in terms of forest fires in, in, in the history of Canada. And scientists directly link the worsening wildfires to the warming climate. But most blazes are still considered natural disturbances, so they don't count in the official tally of greenhouse gas emissions that Canada or any other country reports to the UN. These guidelines are ever-evolving, and it's together globally that we decide on what are the best practices to, to report, to measure, and, and report emissions. The effectiveness of our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets is going up in smoke, literally. We basically need to have a, a global conversation. Who is technically uh, accountable for these? Back in the damaged forest in Quebec, all these dead trees will decompose more swiftly because of these guys. Longhorn beetles speeding up the decay. What you're hearing and seeing here is their larvae boring into the dead wood. So that's the longhorn beetle yeah, making sawdust. Yes, uh, ma making uh, uh, wood dust. As the trees break down, they give off more carbon dioxide. That's a secondary impact of the summer's fires. And will this forest now keep emitting this carbon for years? Yes, exactly. So this is no longer a carbon sink, as they call it. Yeah, exactly. It's beautiful in here. Yeah, it's be very beautiful. After all that gloom in the dead forest, Generetti takes us down the road to where the forest was spared. The fires jumped these patches, thankfully, leaving a green, spongy carpet, the undergrowth of a healthy boreal forest. So we were talking about carbon. In a healthy forest, where is it? This is like uh, the Litteros Phagnum and Mosses, uh, where most of the carbon is. <coughs> and even, even if, we, if we go deeper, into the soil and uh, the, the organic material is more uh, decomposed, the 40% of carbon is uh, in this kind of material. So in a healthy forest, this is the carbon storage? Yes, this is carbon storage. So to accumulate all this material through time, uh, need a lot of years. A lot of years for a forest to do its job filtering our atmosphere but snuffed out in weeks when the fires burned as fiercely as they did this summer. That was Susan Ormiston reporting. Canada's fire season is far from over, and this week began with parts of the country gripped by record high temperatures. Gaining influence with age. Have the spaghetti with the Caesar. How some grandmas are finding a new calling on TikTok. It's young influencers who lead the way in turning online audiences into profile and profit. So in high school, I had a blog. But there's a new generation of older women becoming online role models. You're always going to have a little bit of nostalgia about your own grandmother. Turns out the boomers aren't done yet. Joanna Rumiliotis takes us inside this growing trend to reveal what is driving the power of the grandfluencers. They're rocking bikinis, ruling the kitchens, and snapping up followers and brand deals at a record pace. Where's the bacon? From grumpy grannies to elegant ladies, this is a new class of older influencers, and they're flexing their social media muscles. 
Joan McDonald is 77 and the Ontario native is a heavyweight on Instagram and TikTok. Her workouts have garnered nearly 2 million followers. Use it or lose it. This is Joan, the 76-year-old woman who started her Many of them, journey decades younger. And also developed her personal brand from it. So now you're an influencer in your 70s. Did you see that coming? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not in a thousand years. I started this process because I was very, very much overweight. It all started when McDonald's very daughter nasty. pushed her to get healthy and to share her transformation online. She said, I'm going to put you on Instagram so that you can encourage other people, just talk to them. And I'm going, who's going to talk to an old, an old lady? Well, it, that changed, and it's just been phenomenal. A lot of people say, I just love your smile. Like, it just makes me feel happy when I look at any of your posts. <laughs> Her radiance is real, and followers in Toronto, like Jody Ekovitz, have even become friends. How does she inspire you? Oh my God, in, in a million ways. Like, I just see there are no limits in what's possible, what you can do, how you can live your life, and how you can turn your life around. Seeing that, and it's like, I want what she's got. You know, I want to do what she's done. So women's best Galentine's buy one, get one free special. McDonald's crossover appeal among demographics is a marketer's dream. This partnership is just one of the spin-offs. I don't want to look 25 when I'm 50. Built on a new narrative she and other so-called grandfluencers are creating. Women of a certain age are brilliant. That life as an older woman is far from over. More like just beginning again. Saba Kwao is the chief creative officer at Cassette Marketing and Communications Agency. He says brands are clamoring for a slice because boomers alone are a huge market. Hello. And it's something new. It should be normal, it will become normal, but right now it is new. So when we think about the size of that boomer population, when we think about their economic impact in terms of spending power, disposable income, the market can't ignore them. The so market can't the ignore their clout so and too. that it's proving but to be ageless. Time, Cassette tapped into that with a viral campaign that used grandparents to encourage younger people to wear masks during the pandemic. Implicitly, there is an expectation of wisdom. This isn't someone who's going to try and con you. Hi, this is my outfit of the day. Trust the wisdom of those who actually know better. Jim Tan is a former fashion executive who has deals with dozens of big name brands. She's so busy, we couldn't make an in person interview work. Oh, so nice to meet you. Glad we finally connected with you. You've been super busy. I have been super busy. I'm totally grateful. So we settled for Zoom from Toronto's Dundas Square. All right, we're in this center that has billboards and I'm sure your billboard might pop up. Does it take you by surprise sometimes that in your 60s you started a whole different type of career? Of course it does. I mean, it would be kind of unnatural if, if it didn't. And I actually feel that, wow, my 60s is my best era ever. It's, I've had the best year of my life. Style has no age. And Tan's daughter and regular fashion twin is the one who convinced her to share her outfit of the day. Outfit of the day. Very easy Sunday look today. It took off fast. In the last year and a half, Tan gained hundreds of thousands of followers, has a talent agent, is in the latest Sephora squad, and appeared in a global ad campaign for Clairol. In terms of partnerships, this is a very lucrative business. I think I've probably worked with something like maybe 50 brands by now. It's really like dressing with confidence, dressing with style, bringing yourself you know, forward rather than letting the clothes kind of speak for you. And I think the brands like that. What do you hope older influencers such as yourself are, are doing in terms of ageism? I want to give people this message that you don't need to be afraid about getting older because we are actually showing that there's no expiration date. Being 80 years old, I never planned on being an influencer. No expiration date, because the older, the better. I want to retire? 
Content creators in their late 50s and up to their 90s now number in the thousands on platforms like TikTok and Instagram. Their peer groups love it. This is why I like following fashion influencers who are older than me. And social media's youngest demographic just can't seem to get enough of them. Why do you think 20, 30 year olds are interested in what a grandmother is cooking or what a woman in her 60s is wearing? Um, you're always going to have a little bit of nostalgia about your own grandmother and what you might have learned from your grandparents. There's that kind of generational empathy that I think works. Hello. <laughs> Hello, I'm Joanna. 83-year-old Nonna Elda Sirizotti seems like she could be everyone's Italian grandmother. Hi, how are you? Very well. So what's my day today? Oh, most that's ready. Grilled vegetables are on the menu today. It's the kind of recipe that her younger TikTok and Instagram followers eat up. Just a drop of oil. On the peppers. Yeah, the, everything, on everything. 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 Her granddaughter, Alessandra Rakenna, says it all happened by accident. I just put up a video of you making minestrone soup, and I left it. And then I checked again, and it was at a million views. Wow. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I guess this is the thing we're doing now. <laughs> I know chapo very small because we dry not, okay? The minestrone got Nona Elda's account bubbling. Never cut the spaghetti with the scissors. The pasta trick blew it up. <laughs> we have a TikTok that went very viral. It has 14 million views. And it's just, this is how you open pasta and she bangs the counter. Yeah. And it just like really took off. <laughs> yeah. No, 14 she... million views. That's a lot of yeah. people watching you. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I feel happy. Yeah. I feel happy for me, my mother for her. She does so much work for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The world is there for me. Oh, Nona. Oh, mamma mia. <laughs> Nona Elda has a few collaborations and her own cookbook. We're a clean deck plan like this. And she's getting used to feeling like a celebrity. She gets recognized in the grocery store. Sometimes I feel embarrassed, you know. I go to the store, so many people look at me like this and say, what happened? What I did wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, they recognize you. know Naelda. Oh, my God. Yeah, so many people are afraid to ask me. And some followers have even called her at home. And they phone you, what do they say? Say, I cried last night. I say, why? Because I, you remember my grandma. You know, I say, okay, I'm going to be your grandma. <laughs> I'm a grandma for everybody now, you know, for you too and I'll do the 30-pounders. As for McDonald, her multi-generational influence didn't come easy, and she's still working on it. This is as good as I get. <laughs> because, she says, it's about so much more. A lot of people tell me, like, I've given them hope. If I'm giving them hope, i got to stay there and keep giving them hope. We don't have to buy into this, oh, when you reach a certain age, life's over. It's not. There's so much that's interesting here. The whole time I was watching, I was thinking, I bet you Anna wants to know how much money they're making, because I do. Well, we certainly asked, and they were a little discreet, saying I'm making a little bit, some saying we're, it's a quite a lucrative kind of career. So we know influencers can make $100 to upwards of $10,000 per sponsored post, and that doesn't include other perks like trips and products that they get to keep. So while some are probably making a few thousand, others are making a whole lot more and say it is very lucrative and has created this whole new income stream that they did not expect at this stage in their lives. Financing retirement. Yep. <laughs> All right, Joanna, thank you. Thank you. As wildfires forced Yellowknifers to flee, some stayed to care for those who couldn't. No one really asked any of us to step up and do what we did. We just saw a need and we did it. Feeding an army of firefighters next in our moment. This is chef Nikki McKenzie. So she runs a restaurant in Yellowknife, but when the recent evacuation order hit, she took on a much bigger role. Along with the team of volunteers, she stayed behind to feed firefighters and first responders. And tonight their actions are our moment. My gut instinct just kept telling me over and over again to stay. I know that I have the skills to feed a lot of people very quickly on not a lot. 
and I just kind of thought that that might be a useful skill to have. They evacuated people on the 16th and I started cooking on the morning of the 17th. So we were doing a thousand meals a day plus snacks. No one really asked any of us to step up and do what we did. We just saw a need and we did it. So we started to run out of fresh food and so we rallied together and people started bringing me fresh produce that was growing right here in town. It was really kind of amazing. We did uh, moussaka one night. We did fresh, big, beautiful salads every day. One day we sent out a beef goulash with uh, edible flowers all over it, which I think is something the firemen had maybe never experienced before, but <laughs> hopefully they liked it. One man made a point of coming into my kitchen and telling me that my cassoulet changed his life. <laughs> It was, it was a beautiful moment. It's just, it's what we do. The community needed me, so I stepped up. Uh, good for you. This was a whole community effort. A uh, brewing company brought over their pots. Uh, local fishermen caught some fish. Someone else gave them all the dairy in their fridge. Everybody did this together. Thank you for being with us. To watch anytime, you can download the free CBC News app and subscribe, of course, to the National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.